You know, control is a theme that is very evident here in our passage this morning in the book of James, James chapter number four. And we're going to look at the last parts of these verses here this morning, study the Bible together, looking at verses 13 through 17, James chapter number four. Let me read the verses to you. They'll be on the screen. The Bible says this, it says, come now you say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanisheth. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Verse 16 says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. The title of the the message this morning is Control the Outcome control the outcome. James chapter number four. Can I say this this morning? That control belongs to God. Control belongs to God. It is his will that will be accomplished. God's authority is directly connected to God's sovereignty. Understand this this morning that because God is control of all things, then that makes him in charge of all things. The sovereignty of God is a, is a belief that we must hold on to and understand that God is not taken by surprise by the things of the day. He's not caught off guard by what's happening around us. He is in total, complete control. The Bible says he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. One of the ca- characteristics of God is that he is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present. There's never been a place, there's never been a moment where God has not been. There's never been a time in history where God has not been in the center center of that control. Control belongs to God. It is his will that will be accomplished. God's authority is connected to God's sovereignty. And because God is in control of all things, that makes him in charge of all things. The Bible is very clear in this. As we look at the Bible, we see scripture after scripture. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28, it says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to what? His his purpose, his plan, his control. The Bible says in Colossians chapter number one, verses 16 and 17, it says, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter number 16 and verse number 33, it says, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from who? From the Lord. There's not a decision that is made that the Lord does not have control over, that he is not in charge over. The Bible says in the book of Job chapter 42 and verse two, it says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. There's no purpose, no plan of God that the world can overthrow. The Bible talks about how God is in in charge. And if God wants something to happen, my friend, mark it down, it will happen the way that God wants it to happen. He says his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. His purposes are not disappointed. His thoughts and decisions are not thwarted by man. God is in control. Lamentations chapter three and verse 37 through 39 says this, who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it. It is not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come. Why should a living man complain, a man about the punishment of his sins? Lamentations, he's saying this. He's saying, listen, God is in control. Unless the Lord has commanded it, it's not going to happen. And when the Lord does command it, it will happen. Have I convinced you yet this morning that God is in control, that he is in charge, that his sovereignty is directed to his authority? And because God is control of all things, that he is in charge of all things. Let's just mark it down and let's rejoice this morning that no matter what happens around us, no matter what happens to us, no matter what happens tomorrow or the next day, hey, my friend, you can mark it down. The truth is this, our God is in control. Amen. We celebrate that this morning. We, we thank God for the fact that he is in control. Well, we come to James chapter number four and James here is perplexed about what's going on with these believers. He's so perplexed that he begins to ask them a, a very deep reflecting question. A question that honestly takes longer than a moment to answer. A question that honestly would, you have to sit down and contemplate. 
The question is this, he says, what is your life? What is your life? He says he wants them to think about their life because of the way that they were living. He asked them, he says, what makes you think that you can control your future if you can't even control tomorrow? You see, the reason why he asked him about what their life was to contemplate this reflective question is because somewhere along the line, they began to live as though they were in control. And it's interesting as we study this passage out. Because if God is in control, and He is, if God is sovereign, and He is, then James asks them, he says, what makes you think that you are in control? He actually, in a, in a way, he implies, he asks, he says, when did you start living like you were in control. You say, well, where, where did that, where did that take place? When did you start living like you were in control? We see this very clearly in verse number 13. It says this. It says, come now, you say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade, and here it is, and make a profit. Well, that's pretty presumptuous of you. It's pretty presumptuous that you think that you have so much control over your life that if you plan it a certain way, if you prepare it a certain way, if you decide you're going to do something, that somehow you can control the outcome. And here we see them very clearly say this. They say, what we're going to do is we're going to go to a city. We're going we're to trade. We're going to get settled. And what's going to come of that is that we are going to be able to make a profit. You see, they started to take control of their life when they convinced themselves that they could control the outcome of their life. Now, I know for us, we were more spiritual than that, right? And we would say, I can't believe that these folks would, would do that. But can I ask you a question this morning? Have you ever tried to take control of the outcome of a situation? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Guilty, right? Has there ever been a moment in your life where you planned and prepared because you knew what you wanted, you knew where you wanted to end up, and so you started to take control of the different aspects of the situation because ultimately you thought you could control the outcome of a situation? Can I ask you another question? Have you ever planned something that didn't work out the way you thought? Yes. <laughs> So we all can admit that there has been times in our lives where we have tried to take control. There are times in our lives where things didn't work out the way that we thought they would, but yet we continue to find ourselves going back and being tempted to take control again. Understanding that God is in control, understanding that God is in charge, but yet constantly in our lives and in the lives of these believers, what they were trying to do was say, yes, I know God is in control, and yes, I know everything's going to work out just fine, but I need to work out a situation. I need to make sure it happens this way. I need to make a profit, and so I'm going to plan, and I'm going to prepare, and I'm going to work it out, and James stops and says, wait a minute. What makes you think that you're in control? See, in this passage this morning, James continues to teach us and to teach these believers how to think differently in their life. And he wants them to remember a few things when they're tempted to take control. He gives us the first thing, number one. He says this, when you're tempted to take control, remember this. Remember, tomorrow is unknown. Tomorrow is unknown. Look at verse 13. It says this, come now, you say today or tomorrow we will go into such a, such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. We see the reason they wanted to control was because they had a clear desire. They wanted to make a profit. Who, who can blame them for wanting to be successful in business and wanting to better themselves and want them to have success in their life? They knew exactly what they wanted. It was very clear. They wanted to make a profit. And they were even willing to sacrifice. They were even willing to move. They were even willing to, uh, uh, you know, uh, disassemble their family and, and, and move someplace, even where they didn't know yet. But they said, you know what? We know what we want. We know a year from now where we want to be. We have a clear desire. And the reason 
reason why they wanted to have control was because deep down in their heart, there was something that they wanted and they were trying to figure out how to get it. Can I ask you an honest question this morning? I want you to take a moment before the Lord and answer this question very simply is this. What do you want? What do you want? You say, well, I just want this sermon to be over by 1130 because I got I to get to... No, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about what, what do you want today. I'm talking about in your heart, in your life. What do you want out of life? What are you searching for? What is it in your heart that you deeply desire? For some, it may be, man, I just want to be successful in life. That's what I want. For some, it may be, man, I just want to find that person and marry them and, and, and have a good marriage. For some, it may be, I just want my kids to grow up and be successful. For some, it, it may be a number of different things. But ask yourself, as we go through this message, in your heart right now, I'm asking you to do me a favor. And ask yourself before the Lord, what do you want? What do you want? You see, there was a clear desire here. What are your dreams? Like, what is it that you dream about, that you think about? So many times we allow the world to take away our dreams. And we allow our mistakes to take away our dreams. You think, well, I wanted to do this, and I wanted to do that, but, you know, I didn't go down the right road, and I didn't make the right decision. Can I remind you that our God makes all things new? Can I say that again for some of you that need to hear that? Our God makes all things new. And no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, God can redeem you, He can save you, He can cleanse you, and He can give you a new path and a new direction. So I ask you again, what do you want? What are your dreams? What is it that you want to accomplish in your life, in the lives of others, in your future? We see a clear desire. And I think, honestly, if we were to ask ourselves, if we were to come up here and you were to share, I think, for the most part, almost all of you know what you want. If you had to narrow it down and you took the time to really think about it, you'd say, you know, what I really want is this. We see a clear desire, but then I want you to notice in verse 13, the second part, we see an indecisive direction. It, it says, it's interesting, it says, come now, you say, today or tomorrow. We will go into, I love this, such and such a town and spend a year, year, year and a half, two years, month, year, that was kind of a random, we'll spend a year there and trade, hoping that someone will trade with us and make a profit. It is interesting to me in this verse that there is a clear desire, but there's an absolutely indecisive direction. They know what they want, but they're not sure how to get it. They know they want to make a profit, but they're not sure which town to go to. They know they want to make a profit, but they're not sure which day to leave. They know they want to make a profit, but they're not sure how long to stay. Can I say this? One of the biggest frustrations in life is knowing what you want, but guessing on how to get it. And sadly, I think a lot of us live that way. I think a lot of us in our lives know exactly what we want. But we go about guessing on how to get it. It's an indecisive direction. You know, a lot of people guess about salvation. You know, one of the biggest areas that people guess about, they know what they want. They know they don't want to die and go to hell. They know they want a relationship with, with, with God. They know they want to have their sins forgiven. And so they live their life walking around guessing on how to get it, hoping that if they're good enough, if they go to church enough, if they give money, or hopefully they see a, an old lady walking across the street and go, woohoo, yes, okay, here we go, come with me. Yes, now I'm trying to earn my way. They're, they're trying all kinds of things. There are all kinds of religions and all kinds of teachings where people get up and they say, we all know what we want, but really none of us are sure how to go about getting it. People try to be good. They try to go to church. They try to be moral. They try to work hard. They try to be a good citizen. But can I say to you this morning that the Bible is very clear on how to get to heaven? 
The Bible says in John 14 and verse 6, it says, Jesus saying unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. I thank God this morning that when I was lost and I didn't know the Lord was my Savior, I didn't have to guess on how to get to heaven. I didn't have to figure it out myself. The Bible makes it clear. Come on, somebody. We've got to celebrate this this morning. Hey, the Bible says, Jesus saying unto him, I am the way. You don't need to guess. I am the truth. You don't need to wonder. I am the life. You don't need to worry. No man comes to the Father but by I mean, let me say it clear and emphatic and strong. Jesus Christ is the only way to get to heaven. There is no other way to know the Lord except to have salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Not hope, not wonder, not wish, not oh, if I get it right, maybe I'll guess right. The Bible says you will know for sure that you have eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I say this this morning? God loves you. Jesus died for you, and he will forgive you if you come the way that he says only through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only him. Oh, you can try to outsmart God. You can try to think that your way might work, but can I say this to you as a pastor in love? Your way to God will never, ever work. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I don't say this to you this morning to condemn you. I say this to you because God loves you. And because God loves you, he offers you salvation today. To accept Jesus Christ as your way of salvation. That's what I did when I was 14 years old. I prayed and accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I didn't have to be in church. I was in my room. I didn't have to be a good Christian. I was actually suspended from school. That's another story we won't talk about right now. I was suspended from school in my room. And the Lord, November 19th, 1997, the Lord saved me. And then he forgave me my sins. And I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only way to get to heaven. Can I encourage you this morning to come to God today? Can I encourage you this morning to stop trying to figure it out your own way? Can I encourage you this morning to stop trying to guess on how you can have a relationship with God? I just told you, it is clear. Mark it down. And if I'm wrong, then God is a liar. But God is not a liar. He is truth this morning. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And this morning, I want to encourage you to come to God just as you are. Receive Him as your Savior and have God forgive you of your sins and transform your life. We see. People, they know what they want, but they guess on how to get it. We see, we see a clear desire. We see an indecisive decision. Indecisive direction. People all the time, they're looking for this and for this. People going from job to job, town to town, family to family, spouse to spouse. <laughs> Come on. Can I, speak, can I speak truth here this morning? Can I speak truth here this morning? I will. Because the, the problem is, is that we have a lot of people in our communities that are wandering around like this, looking, trying to figure out what to do, trying to figure, how do I have a good marriage? How do, well, maybe I'll do this over here, or maybe I'll do that over here. I remember when I was really overweight, I used to be really overweight, some of you don't know that, but I used to be really, really big, and everybody, when you're really overweight, like, weight, like I was, I weighed over 400 pounds, when, when you're really overweight like I was, everybody wants you to try their diet. Everybody. Everybody. Oh, it kind of became a funny thing. You know, people come up and say, hey, they, and they do it in like the most loving way, you know? Like, like I'm like, look, I know I'm big. Okay, I know I'm big. All right, okay, it's, it, it, I know. And they say, you know, they got this, they got this one plan here. Oh, tell me about it. Yeah, what you do is you don't eat for 27 days. <laughs> and then you can eat whatever you want for two hours. And then you can't eat for 27 days. We've lost five pounds. Great. Let me let me try that one. You know, yeah, another one. What, what, what do you do? What do you do? Oh, you got these drops, right? And these drops are supposed to put a lock on your stomach, and it locks your stomach down so you're never hungry again. Two drops, right? Now, what do I eat? Nothing. Hmm. Okay. Let me try that one. And I remember, as a as a as a young man, I knew what I wanted. Can I can I just be honest? I knew what I wanted. I didn't want to be that way. I knew I needed to change, but I kept going. 
okay, let's try this one. Okay, uh, Atkins and oh, Slim Fast. Okay, this one here. I'm not knocking anyone. Wait, but I'm, I'm just saying it's like this. And sometimes you just think, man, I just got to stop guessing here. I got to try to figure out what I need to do. You know, a lot of people that's had to live their life. It's how they live life. They wake up on Monday and they go, okay, I got to have a good marriage. Oh, maybe it's this. Or maybe it's that. I, I got to raise the kids right. Okay, maybe it's this way. Oh, uh, maybe it's this way. Oh, I, I got to figure out how to be successful. Okay, maybe it's this way. Maybe it's this way. Can I encourage you just to stop for a minute? You're wearing yourself out. You're, I'm telling you, you're exhausted. You're exhausted because you know what you want, but you keep guessing on how to get it. That's exactly where these people were. You see an indecisive direction, and then we see an unexpected day. He says in verse number 14, he says this, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. And that's the truth. We can plan all day long, but we have no idea what tomorrow will bring. Tomorrow is unknown. This is why he encourages us. He says, stop taking control. Stop trying to control the outcome. Why? Because you have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. Tomorrow could bring a blessing or a burden. We see this in the life of Joseph. Genesis chapter 37, the, word, the verse on the screen, it says, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his, of his ro- robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, verse 24, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. And there was no water in it. You think Joseph woke up that, that morning thinking, I know exactly what's going to happen to me. My brothers are going to betray me and throw me into a pit and sell me into slavery. Probably not on the to-do list. Oh, what time is it? Three o'clock? Oh, got to make sure I get to that pit. (laughs) He had no idea. He thought his life would be just normal like any other day. He thought his life would go about and he would do a few things, spend time with his family. He had no idea what a day would bring, but we see he finds himself in a pit in a day. See, that day brought a burden. It brought a change in his life. But then we see Genesis chapter 41. This is after years now of Joseph being in prison and being falsely accused. He's in prison 17 years. He's in prison for something he did not do. Holding on to a dream that God had given to him. Thinking, God, when, when, when's this going to happen? Maybe it's not going to work out. I know what I want, God. I know what I want. But God, you got to guide me and direct me. In that prison, 17 years, and the Bible says in Genesis 41 and verse 14, It says, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. You see, one day brought a a pit. The next day, mm, he was in the palace. You see, one day brought a burden. See, when I go, mm, that means something good is about to happen right there. Mm. That means God's speaking to me about that thing right there. One day brought a pit. The next day brought a palace. Can I say this this morning? Ooh, what a difference a day can make. Mm Mm-hmm. One day he's walking down to his brothers, and they grab him, they ambush him, they rip off his robe, and they throw him in a pit. They're going to decide to kill him, and they say, well, sell him into slavery. We'll never see him again. Joseph wondering what's going on, and God, what are you doing? I don't know. I have my whole life planned. I was trusting you, but now this day has come and changed my whole life. And for years and years and years, he served in Egypt faithfully, was falsely accused, thrown into a prison for 17 years, hoping, wondering what's going to happen. Is God still real? Is my dream going to come to pass? And all of a sudden, one day out of the blue, yes, yeah, Pharaoh needs to see Joseph. And I'm telling you this morning as an encouragement to you that you may be going through a tough time right now. You may be in a pit right now. You may feel like the world has ambushed you and now you don't know what to do. You thought you had your life planned. You thought things were going to go the way you did. You thought you had it all planned out. You thought you could control the outcome, but something happened to you. Something happened around you that messed you up, that threw you down, that caused your whole life to spin around. Can I encourage you this morning? Hold on to God. Be faithful to God. Don't quit in the tough times because one day... God will take you from the pit to the palace. And God will change you. What a difference a day can make. Say, tomorrow is unknown. See, Joseph, 
understood that? Can I, can I just say this to you this morning? That only God knows what will happen tomorrow. Only God. There's not a news reporter on TV that knows what will happen tomorrow. I'll say that again. There's not a news reporter on TV that knows what will happen tomorrow. There is not a politician that knows what will happen tomorrow. I'm not trying to be political. I'm trying to be biblical here. And I'm trying to say that so many of us look to others around us to tell us what's going to happen tomorrow. Only God knows what will happen tomorrow. The Bible talks about that in verse 16. He says this. He says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Why is he saying that? He's saying, you're planning your life as if you know what's going to happen tomorrow. That's arrogant. Now watch this now. Don't miss this. He's saying to them, your arrogance is evil. Why is it evil? Why is it wrong to plant? Some of you are big planners. I know. I know. I know you. I talk to you. We have coffee, right? Big planners, man. You got your, your head. You're five, you know, there's nothing. He's not condemning planning. But what he's saying is, he's saying that you do not need to have confidence in your plans. That you need to trust the Lord. And here's what he's saying. Don't miss this. He's saying this. The reason why it's evil is because trying to control tomorrow is like trying to take the place of God. If only God knows tomorrow, and you're trying to control tomorrow, then what are you trying to do really? You're trying to take the place of God. You're trying to be the God in your life who controls everything. And my friend, only God controls tomorrow. Proverbs 27 and verse 21 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Our confidence must be in God's power, not our plan. Our confidence must be in God's power, not our plan. We see tomorrow, he says, I want you to realize you can't control the outcome because tomorrow is unknown. And he gives them in verse 14 the reality of their condition. He says, verse 14, he says this, he says, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. We see here he brings out that, that life is momentary. That life is but for a moment. That the life that we live on this earth is a moment that we get from God. Here's the thing you have to understand. That life is momentary, but life is not temporary. I knew I had to say that again. Because I was like, when I saw that on like Tuesday, I was like, thank God, no. No. I have conversations with God in my office. You ever walk by on a Tuesday or something, you'll hear me shouting praising. I was praising this week, man. I was jumping and praising the Lord. If you ever hear screaming coming from my office, it's all good. It's praise to the Lord, all right? It's praise to the Lord. Because I get excited. God showed me this this morning, or uh, this week. That life is momentary. What is your life? It's even a mist, right? Some of you cook, and you see that steam come up from the pot, right? And that steam comes up, and it's gone. It comes up and it's gone. He's saying, listen, you can't worry about controlling tomorrow because your life is just for a moment. It's here and it's gone. And so you got to worry about doing what God wants you to do. Because if you try to control tomorrow, man, you'll, it'll be futile and your life will pass you by and you'll never get what you really want because you didn't do it the way that God wants. And all of a sudden you're going to look up and your life's going to be gone because it's for a moment. Life is momentary. But my friend, life is not temporary. It says, what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time, momentary, and then vanishes away. Here's the question. Where does it go? Where does it go? It doesn't say It ends. It just goes away somewhere. So life is momentary, but life is not temporary because there is life after death. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse 27, it says, And just as it is appointed unto, for man to die, and after this comes judgment. When we die, we don't just go into the ground and that's it and it's over. No, our life is momentary, but it's not temporary. There is life after this life. We will give an eternal account for how we lived a momentary life. The Bible says this in the book of Corinthians. It says, it says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one
may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Here it is right here. you got to get this. The reason why you can't control the outcome is because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And you have to understand that if you try to control tomorrow and you try to make all the choices and you try to be in charge and you try to be in control, don't think that your choices won't matter someday. Because life is momentary, but it is not temporary. The choices we make last longer after the life we live. Last a lot longer. And God says, you better be careful. You want to be in charge? Okay. Just remember, the choices we make last long after the life we live. Then he asks the question, do you really want to be in charge? Because you'll give an account for the choices you make. You're accountable for how you live before the Lord. You see, you have to understand that to, the reason why we can't control the outcome in our life is because tomorrow is unknown. He wants us to remember that, but number two, very quickly. Number two, he wants us to remember that even though tomorrow is unknown, remember this, that the next step is known. The next step is known. Look at verse number 15. It says this, Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So, what, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. He says, you've got to change your perspective about life. As you approach life, as you wake up in the morning, as you approach the day, instead of saying, let me try to control the outcome, what you do is you say, God, I'm going to give you control. You acknowledge that God is in control. You know what that is? That's called surrender. Realizing that you can't control it, but God can. God wants us to surrender. He says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. Why will we say that? Because God's in control, and he knows what tomorrow will bring. And so I'm not going to wake up and say, here's my plan. It's got to work out this way. It's got to happen this way. Uh, this is how I'm going to accomplish what I want. He says, listen, God is not against what you want, but you better make sure you acknowledge who's in charge. And so we ought to wake up in our lives and look around us and say in a humble manner, God, change my perspective about my own life. I am not in charge. God, I want this. God, I'm going to go this way if it's your will. It's your will. If this is what you want for me, that's called surrender. He says, the next step is known. Change your perspective about life and then commit to God's next step for your life. You see, what we do sometimes is we try to plan out a whole year and we haven't even taken the next right step. This is what we do. And James is saying, listen, don't try to plan out a whole year. Just take the next right step. He says, I want you to commit to God's next step for your life. And he says this, verse 15. So whoever, excuse me, verse 17 says, for who's, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Can I encourage you this morning in this message? to not try to control the outcome, but instead do the next thing that God has already told you to do. He says, you already know. Some of you think, oh, I, I don't know. Think about it. What is the next thing that God has already told you to do? You say, well, yeah, I know what it is. Okay, <laughs> I know, I know. We, we've talked, I know. You, you probably know what it is. Too. I know what it is, but you know, you just don't understand. Okay, I'm busy. I got a lot of stuff going on. You know, I don't know if I can like do that big thing. I'll get around to it eventually. Now listen, I may be understanding that, but God doesn't understand that. He says, for whoso knows the right thing to do and what? What does it say? And fails to do it, what does it say? Is sin. It is sinful to ignore God's command. You cannot justify not obeying God. Simple as that. And what we do in our lives, we justify why we can't do something that God wants us to do, right? It's like my sons, you know, I'll tell them to clean the room. Oh, well, I cleaned it last time, and I, you know, and Miles made the mess, and I, right? I don't need to hear that. I just need you to clean your room. Hey, I'll come in. Hey, hey guys, pick up these shoes real quick. Oh, not my shoes! Right? I, I wore those shoes yesterday. They're, okay, they're mine, but I didn't wear them today, Right? You can tell, pray for me, all right? Pray for me as a parent, all right, okay? 
Oh, right? This is what they do. I mean, oh, constantly, constantly, right? We're working on this. You pray for us, all right? We're not perfect, all right? Okay, we're growing, right? Hey, hey, guys, let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and clean up, turn off the, turn off the TV, you know, show, whatever you're doing, or, or put down the Oh, I'm off, I'm off. Hey, it's time for bed. Oh, right? Okay. My son, he tries to make deals with me. He's like a top negotiator, man. We could work for the FBI. I'll tell you what. There was a hostage situation. I'd send Marcus in, man. He'd he'd get that hostage out, no problem. He have the he'd have the, the bad guys giving us money, man. I'll tell you what. He's a negotiator. Well, he'll say, "Now it's time for bed." Well, Dad. <clears throat> now, Dad. Um, seventeen and a half days ago, we were having a conversation. I wrote it down. And you told me that there would come a day in my life where I could stay up an extra five minutes if I asked. I, I want that to be today. <laughs> what? I, who are you, right? Whose child are you, right? Tell you. This is how. Okay, time to clean up. Oh, I can't do it. Oh, right? I know. I, I'll tell you. But I'll tell you. How many times did God, you know, God, you know where I'm going. Come on now. God says, L- husbands, love your wives. Oh! <laughs> you don't know how she is. You don't know how. Right? That's what we do. Right? God says, be faithful to church. <laughs> right? Come on now. I'm not meddling. I'm preaching here this morning. God says, give to the Lord. Wow, this economy. Well, you know, like God doesn't have, like God can't take care of you. Well, God, let me tell you why you can't take care of me. God says, take a step in your life. God doesn't say join a small group, but I can, I'm sure I can find it in there somewhere. <laughs> right? Other things that God says to do. And listen, we're so worried about the sensational. Man, look what I'm doing over here for God. Look at this. Woohoo! Look at all this. I'm mad. I'm doing all this stuff. And God says, I just, I just need you to like to like be kind to your children. I just I just need you to have a forgiving spirit. I just need you to take a step in your spiritual life to grow. I don't know what that is. Getting saved, baptized, joining a small group, serving. I don't know what it is in your life, but we cannot justify not obeying God because God has already told you what he wants you to do. And instead of trying to control the outcome of your life, just commit to doing the very next thing that God wants for you. What has God already told you to do? The Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. What should you do today that you will regret not doing tomorrow? You say, well, I'm going to get to it tomorrow. Do I need to rewind the sermon? Tomorrow's unknown. And so whatever you need to do for God, he's saying, do it now. What God is encouraging us, you say, so what, Pastor Steve? So, okay, fine, so what? What's the big deal? Sorry, okay, I'll, 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 maybe I'll get some time. I'll, I'll talk about, see what God wants me to do. Can I, can I tell you, can I tell you this? That there's nothing sadder than watching somebody go through life trying to guess what they want, trying to guess how to get what they want when God has already told us the next step. Can I encourage you? Can I inspire you? Can I say to you this morning as someone who loves you, stop trying to control the outcome. God is in control. Tomorrow is completely unknown. But the next step is known. And so take the next step and trust God. Can we pray together? Lord, we love you.